Hi, I'm Jacob Deal with Poole College of Management, and today I'm joined by Scott Bolin. Uh, he's an entrepreneur and graduate of the Jenkins MBA program here at Poole College. And Scott, thanks for joining today. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me. And interested in learning about your story and your business ventures. So let's jump right into it. Uh, tell me about before before the businesses. What was your upbringing like? Like you know, college days and what got you into what you're doing now? Sure, so um, I'm a Raleigh native, grew up here, um, went to school in Virginia um, at a small liberal arts college that had no engineers whatsoever. I ended up getting an English degree and, and actually came back and taught English and history at the high school I graduated from here in Raleigh. I did that for four years and realized I wanted to do something different. And so uh, right as I got married, I ended up going back and getting my MBA at Jenkins. And so you got your MBA, but your first business wasn't, uh, it, it was more of a, it started as biomechanical, is that right? Biomaterial. Biomaterial. So it actually, it actually came out of the, the MBA program at Jenkins. So they had this great program called Tech, uh, Technology, Entrepreneurship, Commercialization. And essentially the way it works is teams of MBAs, scientists and engineers are put on a team and they're loaned a technology that someone at the university has invented, but they don't necessarily know what to do with it. So it's it's as uh, early stage as, uh, in our case, one beaker full of foam. And so that's what we were loaned for a year. And this early technology was um, useful for pulling salts and minerals out of water, but the professors that invented it didn't necessarily have a specific application for it. And so for my second year of MBA school, we actually spent a, <laughs> most of our time putting together the genesis for what would eventually be our first startup, Tethys. So it started almost as a class project then, and then turned into the business. It was absolutely a class project. I tell people it was my master's thesis run amok. So I was put on a team of students. Um, we, uh, we developed the idea for what you could use the technology for at the time, back in 2012. Oil was priced at about $100 a barrel, and so fracking, which is a, a way to extract natural gas, was climbing in Pennsylvania and Texas, but they had, we discovered this huge problem, which is the treatment of the wastewater. And so uh, I think our, our claim to fame as students was figuring out exactly how much money was being spent by the oil and gas industry just trucking dirty water out of Pennsylvania to a hole in Ohio where they could throw it away. And we, we came to the conclusion that it was about a half a billion dollars just on trucking. And so with the the foam that this professor in the forestry department had invented, these two professors, um, we figured out a way that theoretically you could treat the water at the hole, uh, the, the, the well site, and then you wouldn't have to truck all that dirty water. And so by the end of our class period, we had actually reached out to some of these oil and gas companies. They were very interested and they would love to do a trial. Uh, they needed 36,000 pounds of our material to do a trial run, and we could make about two grams. So we had a little bit of ground to cover as we spun out, but the, the, basically the kernel of the Tethys idea was already there, and we'd already begun the, the process of writing the business plan. And so, you know, this, this was new territory for you as uh, you and your co-founders, as it would turn out, yep. were going through this process. How did you learn about all of this stuff? Was it kind of just trial by fire? A lot of it really was. And I think the benefit of trying to start a business while you're a student is that there's a lot of people that will give you a lot of grace when you're asking, uh, frankly, completely ignorant questions. And so we would call up uh, oil and gas companies, water treatment companies and say, hey, tell us about your problems. And many of them would take 30, 40 minutes and actually give us the full spiel on the challenges they were facing. And the great thing about entrepreneurs is a, a lot of times you find a, a problem that the industry doesn't think is even solvable. And so we would ask the question, well, what if you could treat the water on site? Would that mean something to you? And no one had ever really considered that using the, the method we had. And that would get the wheels turning. And then what would happen is you'd, you'd kind of iterate with your future customer. So to me, that's really the best way to do it is to throw out some ideas with somebody that, that knows about the industry and have them give you some feedback. And I think the, the beauty of being as ignorant as we were is we, we came into it with a blank slate and so we didn't have any preconceived notions of what would and wouldn't work. And so we got to throw an idea that hadn't been tried before and it, it, it stuck with uh, some of the folks in the oil and gas industry. So you finish the MBA program, you realize you've got a good idea. Yeah. Uh, from there, what, what's the next step to investing and what, did, what was feedback from investors? 
because I assume you hadn't done that before either, pitching to investors. You're absolutely right. One of the things I did have in my, uh, my quiver was I'd actually been able to see dozens of other startups pitch because I was an intern with an entrepreneurship program at NC State. So I kind of knew what, what, you know, how it would go wrong if you did it incorrectly, but uh, we had a long way to go. So, you know, frequently with startups, you get to see the end point. It looks like an overnight success. But for us, we graduated in May of 2012 and the first you know, dollars didn't come in until January of 2013. So upon graduation, the very first thing I did was go to my wife and say, hey, I'm, uh, after two years of grad school, I'm gonna not get a job and I'm going to work in coffee shops on my business plan until we get it right on uh, <laughs> getting this business plan together so that someone will fund it. And so I was very fortunate to have a, a great support network with my wife, but also some mentors in, in the NC State ecosystem. So there were a couple alum, one was a, a serial entrepreneur named Chris Evans, and the other was a, um, an architect named John Rufty. Uh, who's very involved with a, a lot of the business school. And both of them came and said, hey, if, if you can get this to something real, we'd be very interested in helping with you. And, and Chris in particular was, was very generous with his time and um, <laughs> was very uh, candid with some of the early iterations of my business plan, which were uh, objectively awful. <laughs> and so for, for many months, I would iterate a business plan. I would go back to him. He would say, that's not quite it. And eventually what happened was he got so excited about what we were doing that he, he became not only an investor, but also our chairman of our company. And so once I had him on board as a chairman, we were able in January to raise our first round of funding. So it took months of uh, working in coffee shops and having my, my classmates at Jenkins going, you're not getting a job? What, you're, you're, what are you doing? Uh, before we actually got anywhere. And then of course it always looks like you know, it was this overnight success, we had a business plan, we pitched it, and then money came flowing in. It's, it's never like that. And from there, uh, it's, it wasn't always, it's not always easy to just continue. You get your first round of funding, and nothing, it doesn't just go smoothly all the time. What, what kind of failures or pivots happened along the way for you guys? Well, we, uh, we had a, a, a pretty big failure pretty early on. So when we raised our first round of funding, the idea was really to try to get to that 36,000 pound number as quickly as possible for the oil and gas industry. So they have these, these trial wells in Texas where they can run a, a demo and we can make a few grams at a time. So on our current production schedule, sometime in the 25th century, we'd be able to do our first trial. So we needed a way to, to mass produce this biomaterial. And so our first round of funding wasn't about, you know, hiring oil and gas staff or anything like that. It was, how do we make more of this foam? And, um, so we, we raised enough money to make it through about nine months of work. And uh, things did not go as well as we'd like, so part of our plan was to work with NC State on a new machine they had coming in um, to, to produce the technology. And uh, that machine got stuck at Customs for about two months, and again, out of nine. And so we, we, we managed to, to push through that. And then by the end, with about one month of funding, we actually managed to produce enough of the, enough of the material that we could do some more elaborate tests. And we found a couple things. Uh, one was that the material was um, roughly about a quarter as good as what it seemed to be in lab conditions. So what you frequently find is that things that work in a Petri dish don't work quite as well as you'd like them to in a real world condition. And once we were able to make a little bit more of the material, we found much to our shock that it didn't quite work quite as well as we'd like it to. And the second thing we learned is that when we went back to price the material out, we found that one of the key ingredients was roughly four times more expensive than what we had calculated. And so, if, you know, I'm, I'm an English major, not a great math student, but that put us many, many times out of the lane of where we needed to be economically with about one month of funding left. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there, an, an English major turned chemical entrepreneur who has raised one round of funding, and it was pretty clear that I totally screwed it up. And so that was a, pretty, um, was a pretty dark phone call to our board to say, hey, this is how far we, off we are. But I think one of the things that, that really worked out well for us was being as honest as we were. So we went to the, the board and we said, here is exactly how far we've screwed up. Um, and here's, here's what we think we can do. So we have two options. One is we can try to fix it. We can switch out the ingredient. We can try to make it reusable. So we had originally modeled it as a one-time use sponge, soak up the salt, squeeze the water out, throw the sponge away. We can make it recyclable. That would be great. That was in our plans anyway. 
the second is to try to make uh, lemonade out of the lemons we had, which is all the work that we'd done was really around using this new machine to mass produce biomaterials and maybe something else would be useful. So, you know, prior to that, we'd really been focused on water treatment. In fact, Tethys is the Greek goddess of fresh water, which was my contribution to the, t the team because I used to teach mythology. English major. English major, exactly, yeah. So, um, so we, we, we told the board, give us a week, we will take a look and we will come back with our recommendation on which, if either of these two, or we could also give you back the, the few pennies we have left. And um, I, I could figure out what, um, what a, a failed MBA entrepreneur does, uh, which was you know, really nerve wracking and, and caused me a, a lot of anxiety. But uh, so we went back into the lab and we started looking around at all of our samples and the things that they could be used for. And we found one in the corner that uh, the, the, the scientists had called a failed sample. And I said, well, what's wrong with it? And they said, well, you know, the, the way we designed the technology, it's supposed to soak up the salt water, you squeeze it like a sponge, you get dirty sponge and clean water. This one, you, you put water through it and it soaks it up and turns into a goo. And, you know, we, we kept looking at it and we thought, you know, that, that looks pretty neat. I mean, it's, it's really turned into like this weird kind of jello material. It's a little bit weird because it has a ton of salt in it. That seems like kind of a neat feature that the dirty water would turn into a goo. And I asked the scientist, uh, you know, my co-founder, I said, well, what do you, what would you call this goo? And he said, well, maybe a, a super absorbent polymer. And I had no idea what that was. I'm, I'm a, a young guy in my twenties, no kids, didn't mean anything to me. So we did uh, some Googling and we found that super absorbent polymers are the key ingredient in the diaper industry. And a really, really important one, it's the the, the powder that you find in the diaper that turns the urine into a gel. And it is the most expensive ingredient, the most important ingredient in the diaper. It's an $8 billion product. And uh, more importantly to millennials, it's also the thing that makes diapers not in any way sustainable because it's made from a petrochemical. And so while every other consumer product you can think of is getting more sustainable, more renewable materials into it, diapers, because they're getting more high tech every year, are using more and more of this petrochemical and we had accidentally invented one that was made out of biomaterials. Uh, so we did what we did when we were grad students. We started calling people up and we were very fortunate that a very large private label diaper company actually had their corporate offices across the street. And so we called up their R&D group and said, hey, we will, we will feed you Chick-fil-A if you will come over and have a look at our goo. And um, so, so they, they brought their scientists over and looked at our goo and they looked at it and they kind of poked it and they, they asked a bunch of clarifying questions about what we had done. And they said, well, you have um, accidentally invented the holy grail of diaper technology, which is a biodegradable, bio-based, super absorbent polymer. And, you know, being the CEO on the team, I said, great, when would you like to buy some? And they said, well, hold on. It is the greatest one ever, but it's still roughly an order of magnitude off of where it needs to be for us to actually put it in a real diaper with a real human and some other things that we needed to run. And so they gave us all the tests that we would need to run. You know, the diaper industry had a, a series of tests that, do, that they would need. They gave us some performance metrics and said, if you can hit this, we would, re we would be really interested. So we went back to our investors and we said, well, we could do the reusable thing, but let me tell you about diapers. And you know, there were quite a few chuckles about you know, going from fracking to diapers. But because we had talked to that diaper company and we were able to give them some clear metrics, uh, the, the investors said, well, we're interested in continuing to pursue this idea. And so every single investor put in as much money or more the second time around from our uh, colossal mistake uh, to, to chase this diaper idea. And so we were re, you know, got a refill on our funding and we chased diapers for, for several years to get it where it needed to go. That is incredible, you gotta say. Pretty unpredictable. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like with your board of investors, you know, they, they invested in, you, you had a, a little bit of a proof of product, but they still trusted you and your team. Uh, one thing I've heard a lot is investors really investing in the team and the people and the minds behind the product even more than the product itself. Yeah. It, what, has that been your experience? Oh, it absolutely is. And I would encourage anybody that is an entrepreneur to really consider the investors you bring in that that is what they are looking for. So you want investors that are uh, understand that the idea that you're putting out there is your 
your best guess at what you think is going to work, but also understanding that things are going to change. And, and the best investors I have very frequently tell me that almost none of their successes that they've invested in started as the, or finished as the original idea that they started with. And so one of the things that my mentors were incredibly useful for and very helpful was helping put, a, put that team of early investors together. And so not only were they flexible on the pivot, but they also gave us some credibility on things that we didn't have the experience in. So we had investors that were experienced in sustainability and, and, and uh, bio-based startups. We had those that were interested in manufacturing. And so when I'm giving a, a presentation and I'm talking about these issues, the fortunate thing is the investors didn't have to rely on 100% of what Scott thinks about bio-based materials going into the diaper industry. I was able to pull from different pools of investors to check the facts of different aspects of what I was saying. And I think that's really important when you're putting together an investor group is money is great, money is incredibly you know, necessary, but what's really helpful is if that investment comes with some knowledge, even a piece of what you're trying to do, that you can kind of build out the, and fill in the gaps of where you have some, uh, we'll call it credibility deficits, of which I had many. So you had been at it with Tethys for a few years now, you've got the product off the ground. Uh, what happened next that really led to its success? And then, you know, just a few years later, you started another company. Well, we, I wouldn't say we had a full product yet. We were kind of back to the same place we were with fracking. So the, the diaper companies had given us some metrics in terms of what they needed to see in terms of performance. Uh, over a couple of years, we'd gotten very close and they came back and said, great, we're ready to do a trial, which I've, I've now learned is, is a new problem all to itself, which is scale. Whenever you're doing with the material, scaling up the, at, at good economics and performance is harder than it looks. And so for the diaper industry, to make a decision to purchase is a big deal. You're talking eight, maybe even nine figure transaction just for that one ingredient. And to trial it, that means they need to shut the diaper line down and run your material on it. And that's, that's a career making decision to shut one of those things down because not only could it not work, but if we've been uh, misleading about the technical performance, we could actually make the machine explode from dust and other things. So no pressure diaper guy. Um, and so for the diaper industry, the, the really interested customers were interested in trying it and they were interested in, in actually taking some risk by slowing their machines down enough so that we could give them the smallest amount possible, which for them was a ton, um, a literal ton. And for us, uh, we could do about three kilos a week, which again would put us some time in the, the 22nd century before we could get them the, the scale we needed in our current production. So we knew we needed to scale up to a pilot plant and we had begun the process of, of looking into what that should be when the city of Raleigh called us up and said, hey, uh, CNN Money would like to do a piece on startups in the community and you're a diaper company, we think that's funny and, and, and interesting, would you like to talk to them? And so we, we talked to CNN Money they did a, a piece on us uh, really about the idea of solving the, the growing problem of landfills and diapers, where something like 8 to 10% of landfills are full of these diapers. And if you don't solve the absorbent problem, you're basically wasting your time. Well, it turned out that the diaper industry reads CNN money pretty aggressively. And so we, we actually ran the numbers. It was something like 95% by volume of the diaper industry globally called us in a three week span and said, when can we get that one ton? And we said, well, we, we can do three kilos a week. So the, the fifth of never. And so we went back to our investors and said, now is absolutely the time to raise money to build a pilot plant and then get ready to launch that full scale plant where you're not doing tons, tens of tons, tens of thousands of tons. And so it was a two step process, do the pilot plant and get ready for the, the full scale plant. Um, while we were in the middle of that, we actually began moving laboratories and the original, one of the original inventors from NC State, a guy named Joel Pollack, who's in the forest biomaterials department, he came to me and said, uh, Scott, I've been thinking a lot about bourbon. And you know, I, I know Joel pretty well, but I was a little concerned because that's sort of a strange thing to say in a diaper lab is I've been thinking a lot about bourbon. And by that, what he meant was in his, in his garage at home, he'd been thinking a lot about the problem of how dark spirits like rum and whiskey and bourbon and scotch are manufactured in parallel. So nothing to do with the Tethys technology, just 
likes solving problems and is just a brilliant inventor. And what he had worked out was that the problem with making these spirits is that you, you, you take this clear alcohol and then you put it in a barrel and you age it for a very long period of time in a warehouse. And that all sounds really romantic because the spirit industry has done a really good job of marketing that. You can find you know, commercials of Mila Kunis wandering around an empty rickhouse and, and everything. And they, they you know, emphasize your, your grandmother's recipe and all these other things. But what we found when we started really talking to them is that it's, it's actually a giant pain in the butt to manufacture. So the barrel itself, you have, to, you have to toast and age the barrel for a year before you put the liquid in it. And then you have to put the barrel in a warehouse and you have to let nature take its course. So wherever you build that warehouse called a rick house, that's going to be a huge impact on what it tastes like. So Jack Daniels, which is made in Tennessee, isn't going to be moving to Idaho anytime soon because the weather's totally different. Right. And so, and what we found is that it's not quite as predictable as they'd like you to think it is. And so inside these warehouses are people called blenders and those blenders wander around the rick house and they pull barrels from different parts and they blend them together to hope to get to the same consistency that they got to the year before. So there are costs associated with it. There's planning associated with it. There's consistency problems. It's really a centuries old manufacturing process. And really the problem is this maturation in a barrel. So what Dr. Pollock had invented instead was a way to get those flavors that you would associate with whiskey uh, into the alcohol, not in years and not in an unpredictable fashion, but he'd, he'd come up with a way to do it in hours using a machine. And, and so I said, well, Dr. Pollock, what, what do you think it'll take to do a, a prototype? It was a little distracting from diapers, but I'm kind of intrigued. And he said, well, $10. And so I said, that's in our budget. And so he built a prototype that involved uh, cutting a hole in a, in a college refrigerator and a bunch of tin foil and a pipe that was 10 feet tall. And I never quite understood how it all worked, but on the very first try, he took clear alcohol and he turned it brown and it tasted pretty close to liquor. So right in the middle of raising a, a pretty giant round of funding to bring this diaper technology to the market, we also were sitting on this completely different, completely novel technology for finishing spirits into a, a final product. And so for about six months, I was spending time raising money around, let me tell you about our diaper bourbon company. And we realized pretty quickly that for investors, that was an incredibly difficult thing to, to work their way through. So there aren't a whole lot of diaper focused investors to begin with. In fact, I would say there are none. And so a lot of what I do when I'm raising funding is explaining to them the problem we're solving and how we're trying to get there. So asking anybody to understand a five-year-old technology that's on the verge of scaling to being an industrial chemical company, and also this nascent liquor technology that, that's sitting in, in a closet in our lab at the same time was incredibly difficult. And so we realized that we really needed to split these into two different projects pretty quickly. And so looking at both Tethys and Next Century, I realized that you know my, um, my value as a, an English major turned MBA uh, was probably diminishing as we moved closer and closer to, to a plant that would literally have train cars delivered every day of raw materials. And so we decided that what we would do is we would split Tethys out from this other tech and we would hire a CEO for Tethys that actually had that experience. And so we were able to find um, a, a gentleman that had been a COO at a hundred million dollar biomaterial startup that had been there. We brought him in and I took uh, the, the, the liquor technology that we now call Next Century Spirits, and we spun that into its own entity. So in some ways, Next Century is a totally new startup. It's totally new staff, totally new technology. But in other ways, it's, the, it's really a, a spin out or a repeat of what we did with Tethys. So many of the same investors, uh, very similar stages, many of the same problems that a new technology that has a material component has. So for me, it's a great opportunity to take all the mistakes that I made at Tethys and try to, um, try to not make those mistakes and make new mistakes at Next Century. So at this point, you know that you have uh, a good, a viable product with Next Century Spirits. With getting that launched and off the ground, what was, what was different with that than what happened with uh, getting Tethys launched? So it really had to do with how the, the market reacted to what we were bringing. So in, in diaper world, we were a decades-long 
top of the wish list solution. So the diaper industry is known forever that the consumer wants to be more sustainable. They know that they need to get this problem solved. The problem is um, if you take a look at the suppliers, they're very, it would be very difficult for them to switch. So they really needed this solution. If you look in the, the world of spirits, there's much less of an emphasis on innovation. In fact, on the production side, I would say there's no emphasis on innovation. And so while we had a solution that we could give you measurable cost improvements, time to market, uh, better consistency, all these really positive features, in many ways, when we go to the spirit industry, we have to overcome a lot of anxiety about changing something that has been tried and true and that has worked forever. And so while we were able to do taste tests that were really convincing, very early on, we found a number of our potential customers were afraid of what we were bringing to the market. They, it could harm their position. It could, it could have a, a number of negative impacts. And so for more than a year, we actually spent a lot of our time really crafting the way we describe the technology, the way we package it together in ways that Tethys never had to be done. Tethys, we knew it needed to be a powder. We, it needed to have this density and we need to be able to prove that it was biodegradable. And if it did those things and worked well enough, everybody would want it. With Next Century, the nuance, the understanding of the art, the, the, the combining technology with tradition in an industry that doesn't do a lot of technology is really the trick uh, because the technology worked almost immediately and it scaled almost immediately. It, it was really the, the making it digestible for the industry. And that's the major difference between the two companies. And you mentioned earlier uh, the marketing of the romanticizing of the barrel aging concept. Is that something that you've really had to fight, uh, not just with you know, the, the general consumer base, but you know, even a master distiller, I'm sure you know, a, a 25 year old barrel aged bourbon just kind of has that ring to it or something. Is that something you've had to deal with? It absolutely is. And, and we, we really have two answers for that. First is there will always be a market for old age product. In fact, what you find is at that, at this very high price points, you're buying the age of the product even more than you're buying the quality of the product. In fact, I can take really old product and really young product that we had nothing to do with, and you'll find a pretty mixed result on a, on a blind taste test. So despite the industry perception, age of the product is not the only qualifying factor in terms of quality. And so there will always be a market where we do not necessarily address it. Um, you know, a 15 year old product is a 15 year old product. We're not Dr. Who, we don't affect time. Uh, but what I would say is that we have a solution for everybody in the market that is complimentary. So we're not here to re replace the traditional a uh, aging process. We're here to make it, uh, cheaper. We're here to make the quality more consistent and the like. So we have customers that actually take many year old product and run it through our process to get more complexity. So I think it's a, a seven or a nine year old product where we actually improve it even further. And we have customers that are at the very beginning of the, the distillation process that want that, that finishing aspect. And so for us, what we're about is not um, disrupting in the classical sense of, of the traditional process. We're here to complement it. So we're um, one more tool in the toolbox for the master distiller. We're more colors in their palette. We're all of those things. We're not here to tell you that the way you did it is dumb and the way we did it is smart. And we've seen a number of our competitors go into the market that way and it's not well received. And so we are very careful and nuanced to say, we're coming alongside you with this technology to make it uh, make your life easier. We're not here to tell you that you've been doing it wrong the whole way. And so that, that was a nuance that very early on I didn't have. And so it took us about a year of really talking to distillers at all sizes to say, what kind of package does this solution need to be in for you to actually use it? And so we're very, very precise in what we, the way we describe it. And we are very much a fan of the industry and the way they do it. We're just adding one more, um, one more tool in their tool belt. So tell me about the state of things today. Where is Next Century Spirits right now? And how did you kind of make, make the transition from Tethys and exit that venture? Well, so when we raised Tethys's uh, Series C round of funding, which was uh, about two years ago in 2018, we split the company into two. So very quickly on, we hired a CEO. I still sit on the board at Tethys, uh, but I try to stay out of the way as much as I possibly can. 
and we began the process of spinning out Next Century. So in its first year, Next Century had really three employees. We were renting space from another distillery, and we had one machine. Um, we did a lot of voice of the customer work, and we realized very early on that we needed to be our own customer. So we had launched um, a product in conjunction with a rapper named Yellow Wolf that really, that was pretty much the only activity commercially that we were doing was getting uh, Yellow Wolf's uh, product into the market and it was doing very well. Starting in 2019, we began really practicing commercially. We went to our first trade show. Uh, we began talking to um, more customers, both here and abroad. And we really didn't get our first customer from a trade show until July of 2019. So Next Century has been around in some form or fashion since 2017 but really hasn't been a real company with all of its functions uh, that long, not since really late 2019. So we didn't hire our first operations staff until late 2019. Um, and so as we went into 2020, we knew we needed to, to get some growth funding in. We did that uh, almost to the day that the stock market collapsed due to the COVID issues. And so through the first half of 2020, there really wasn't a whole lot of uh, activity with the customers on anything involving new technology, switching suppliers and the like. And so we spent most of the first half of 2020 selling hand sanitizer. So uh, that gave us a couple of benefits. One is that we, we were able to get the revenue to hit our projections. The second is we had just hired all this operational staff and we got to uh, test them out uh, on, on some pretty, uh, pretty intense operational issues. So I think in a, in a two quarter span, we did something like 1600 transactions and ship 16,000 gallons of hand sanitizer. And that doesn't even include the, the, the bottles we, we, we resold to, uh, to different people. And so that was, a, that was a great way to sort of offset the, the troubling times with COVID. Uh, but as you, you, you fast forward to the second half of 2020, that market has started to open back up. So in, in October of 2020, we actually shipped more product than we did in all of 2019. So tens of thousands of gallons of spirit were shipped and that, that came in a, a number of different formats. So we shipped whole shipping containers of bourbon abroad. Uh, we packaged up bottles, we put things in cans, we sent um, thousand liter totes. And so we actually had to go to two chefs uh, with our production just to keep up with this demand. Um, our product classifications, I, you know, we do something like several dozen different types of products. So it's everything from your bourbons to your whiskeys to your cocktail and cans. So we went from being sort of in a holding pattern during COVID to everybody wants a product all at once. And so uh, the, the fall of 2020 has really been a, a period of extreme growth for us as the markets have opened back up. What other lessons would you have uh, for you know, a, a, a recent graduate or someone who might be an MBA program like you you were, what what advice would you tell them as far as what to expect or, or you know, just go into the unexpected? Yeah, I, I think there's a pretty common misconception that, that the willingness to take risk is where it, where it ends. So um, I'm not a, a person that's gonna jump out of an airplane or go to a casino or take risk for the thrill of risk. For me, it's about very, very calculated effort-driven risk. And so what I would encourage anybody coming out of school, one, it's never gonna be a better time than right out of school to launch something. So in, in my case, uh, as a former school teacher coming out of grad school, telling my wife I wasn't gonna get a job, there weren't a whole lot of expenses that we had to offset because we were already you know, dirt poor. So that really helped. And so before you take on you know, mortgage or other responsibilities. If you think you have an idea you want to chase, you should chase it right out of school before those things start to, to weigh you down. I, um, I struggle to think how I would, would have started Tethys as a mid thirties with a three year old. That, that's a level of, of difficulty that, that I really admire when people do that. And so you need to keep that in mind. But the second aspect of it is it isn't, it isn't luck and it isn't just being willing to take risk. It's about, putting real concerted self-driven effort into what you're doing. Um, you know, I, I didn't go into either of these projects having any expertise and that came from just sheer uh, force of Google uh, and, and talking to people to become an expert because there isn't going to be somebody that's going to come bail you out and say, hey, you know, 
you look like you have a good idea, look at that huge total addressable market, I'm gonna write you a giant check. You have to put in the effort, you have to be the expert in what you're doing, and you have to, to take extreme ownership in whatever, whatever your project is. So I run into too many uh, students that are excited about taking the risk, but maybe aren't quite as excited about the, the thankless uh, hours of reading and hours of you know asking you know maybe this is a dumb question but can you tell me about X Y Z with with experts and you have to have that component if you're going to succeed. One other thing that I think a lot of new or young entrepreneurs uh, have a mindset of is that there is there is a right way of doing things or one way to to launch a business. Yep. That hasn't been your experience though, has it? No, I think for every entrepreneur, it takes some, some internal um, soul searching to find out your right, right way of doing business. So for me, um, you know, the things that drive me are you know, the, the skills that came from being a former English teacher. So you know, I have a, a, a pretty high reading velocity, um, I, I'm pretty good at, at, at uh, giving a presentation in a certain time span. And those are the skill sets that I brought in terms of fundraising, in terms of building the business plan. Um, my, my strengths are going to be really around the narrative. My weaknesses are definitely going to be around the technology and uh, those kinds of things. And so figuring out where my deficits are and where my strengths are, playing to those strengths. And so I'm not the Stanford computer science undergrad that had the professor that wrote him the starter check. Uh, I'm, I'm an English major that, that taught for four years, and so I had to play to those strengths and address them. And I think investors, they get excited about joining a story. And so if your story is authentic and true, they're going to find a way to be a part of it. And so you have to figure out what your story is, how you're going to lead the project you're going to chase uh, before you're ever going to raise money. Uh, because just because you have all the elements that look like a classical, you know, comp sci, software startup guy, you have to have authenticity about what you're doing. And a lot of that comes from figuring out what your right version is. And a lot of that's gonna take, you know, saying, who am I? And that's where it starts. Well, Scott, thank you so much, so much for joining and sharing your successes and lessons learned. I think it's gonna be, your story is gonna be really helpful and useful to a lot of young new entrepreneurs, whether they're out of school or still in their, their Jenkins MBA program. So thanks for sharing. Thanks for having me.